Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Tech Forum session. I'm Hannah Johnston, Project Coordinator at BookNet Canada. Welcome to our panel. I opened a bookstore during the pandemic. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we're on today. This is an acknowledgement that is deeply personal due to this virtual platform and the wide range of locations people are joining from today. Today, I'm broadcasting from the traditional territories of the original nations of this land. The Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat Indi Indigenous peoples. I encourage you to visit the nativeland.ca website to learn more about the peoples whose land you are joining from today. BookNet Canada endorses the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and supports an ongoing shift from gatekeeping to space making in the book industry. In the spirit of that acknowledgement, I confirm our responsibility in mending the sacred hoop with Canada's Indigenous peoples, to be an ally to all Black, Indigenous, and people of colour, and to unite and work alongside one another. During today's presentation, if you're having difficulties with Zoom or have any tech-related questions, please direct your questions to tech support in the chat. And you can find this option by using the drop-down menu above the chat box, or you can email techforum at booknetcanada.ca. We're providing live ASL and closed captioning for this presentation. To see the captions, please find the live transcript button in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen, click on it and choose show subtitle. If during the presentation you have questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A panel found in the bottom menu. Lastly, we'd like to remind attendees of the Code of Conduct, please do be kind, be inclusive, be respectful of others, including of their privacy, be aware of your words and actions, and please report any violations to techforum at booknetcanada.ca. Please do not harass speakers, hosts, or attendees, or record these sessions. We have a zero tolerance policy and you can find the entire code of conduct at techforum.booknetcanada.ca slash code of conduct. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Lori Whiteman has been a bookie as long as she remembers. First as a voracious reader, then as a library worker and now as a bookseller at River Bookshop, a small indie bookshop in beautiful Empressburg, Ontario. She plans to live long enough to finally get through her to read pile. Stacey Batchelor is an educator, librarian, nature lover, busy mom, and co-owner of Fable Book Parlor. Fable opened on June 1st, 2021 with the Fable Bookmobile and the storefront Fable Book Parlor opened on September 25th of 2021. The store offers a diverse hand-fixed selection of new and used books, vinyl records, and music accessories. Carrie Doyle is also brand new to the bookselling business and opened her cute little bookshop on December 1st, 2021 in Cook Street Village in Victoria, BC. They sell new and used books, kites, toys, sassy greeting cards and shenanigans. Carrie had a pandemic crisis of heart in January, 2021 in the height of lockdown land and decided to live her dream of opening a bookstore. She gave up all Zoom meetings and found the best spot in a great community to start living a life full of books, book people, and a decent amount of shenanigans as well. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce Tim Middleton, who is project manager and retailer liaison at BookNet Canada. Tim will be leading the discussion today, so over to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Hannah, and nice to meet you all. I, I know Lori, and this is my first time meeting Stacy and Carrie. Welcome, nice to, nice to meet you. So I have some uh, questions that we put together and I'm gonna start with the first one. And I think I'll just start from uh, my right. I'm looking at Stacy, and then we'll go around to Lori and Carrie. And our first question is, what sparked the idea to start a bookstore? I mean, especially during a pandemic. Did the idea form before the pandemic or during the pandemic? And what's your backstory? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, so I guess I should have said in my sort of bio there that uh, I live in Revelstoke, British Columbia. So it's a small town in the interior of BC. Um, We've had a bookstore here for many years. Uh, she was ready to move on. I think she had moved to the States and you know, was ready to, to change it up. Um, I didn't actually realize that she was gonna close until after she'd closed. 
Uh, and then I was cross country skiing with a friend and I was like, I can't believe we're not gonna have a bookstore. You know, every town needs a bookstore. Um, and she had said to me, you should open a bookstore. Um, and I kind of went like, no, no, I've never wanted to be a business owner. Um, there's lots of things about owning a business that were very daunting to me, like the admin side and the bookkeeping and all of those things. Um, but then I couldn't get it. It was like this little kernel had been planted in the back of my brain and I couldn't get the idea out of my head. Um, just listening to the bios that were read, I really liked uh, that idea of like the crisis of heart. I think I've been in that for a while. I have young kids and my youngest went to kindergarten this year. I always knew that I was going to be ready to do something else. Um, and especially with the lockdown, um, I just was itching to be involved in a different way. Um, so this idea of opening a bookstore took off in my brain and I just kept moving with it and kept thinking, okay, is this just a really fun thought experiment or am I actually going to do this? Um, and I came to the point at one point that I decided, yes, like I want to do this. And um, I found some business partners, which made it possible for me because I have a husband who works, you know, many, many hours and two young kids. I didn't want to be in it by myself. So um, I have a couple amazing business partners and and here we are, you know, just almost a year later from even having that seed planted and it's grown into something super meaningful to me. Sorry, Stacy. I don't know. Did you mention the name of the store that? Uh, oh yeah. So our bookstore is called Fable Book Parlor. I, is sorry, and this is the same name of the store that closed. That no, it's not, and okay. so it has no affiliation at all. We didn't purchase the space. We didn't purchase her inventory. I didn't even have the idea until she had already closed her doors. Um, and sorry, is it? We we offer something quite different. It, hers was only new inventory. Um, and so we do new and used, and we haven't had a music store in Revelstoke in many years either. So we sell things like guitar strings, um, picks, ukuleles, vinyl records, vinyl players. So we're kind of part, part music, part books. Okay, great. Thanks. And over to Lori Whiteman. Um, uh, this is a little bit of a tricky kind of a story. So our, our owner, my owner, Richard, um, always, like Stacy said, believes that every small town needs to have two things, uh, a library and a bookstore. Um, so well before the pandemic, he um, thought, you know, I, we should open a bookstore in um, Amherstburg. I was working at the library and had met Richard through other means. And he um, asked me one day, if I, if I opened a bookstore, would you run it? And I thought, yes. Yeah. Sure, whatever, Richard. Uh, and then next thing you know, he's like built a or bought a 130 year old building and he's renovating it and it's going to be the bookstore and he stole me away from the library. Um, so it, the, the genesis of it all was well before the pandemic, all the renovations and all that was right when the pandemic started. I had resigned my library job March 9th, and then everything closed down, like I think a week later. Um, so we, all the planning was before, but all the, the implementation was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So we don't know anything different um, than pandemic book selling. <laughs> Probably a good place to start <laughs> in book selling. You can only go up from here, right? <laughs> And Carrie Doyle, what is your? Start? Well, uh, lifelong book lover, obviously, but uh, heavy duty into having a corporate life before that. And uh, I, you know, I was talking about this with my husband. No, I, I never even thought I would open a bookstore before the pandemic, honestly. It wasn't a lifelong dream of mine. Um, I've always loved books, but I kind of looked at the book industry from the outside. Uh, it was the pandemic actually that made me think that what the pandemic has done for people has made them be more appreciative of bookstores and small local communities and bringing people back so that made me think I think this is a very good idea so I live in Victoria 
we are <laughs> home to some of the monsters in independent bookstores. Like, who do I think I am? We've got Monroe's, we've got Russell's, uh, Bowen's. These are big, awesome independent bookstores. And I'm thinking, I, you know what I'm going to do? Open an independent bookstore without having any experience uh, in Victoria. Um, so it came on Independent Bookstore Day, actually, funny enough, the idea that I said, you know where a bookstore should be is Cook Street Village in in uh, Victoria. So we went and drove down there and there was a space for lease. So, uh, and there's never spaces for lease down here. There used to be a bookstore uh, five or six years ago, a used bookstore on the in the village. It went out of business six years ago and it was here for 20 years. I'm the late, I'm the newest girl here. I opened December 1st. I got my lease November 1st and I worked my butt off uh, to get open in time for Christmas. And honestly, the pandemic, uh, I haven't had a big effect of it. It was more all the rivers, atmospheric ones that destroyed our roads out here that kind of made things really challenging for me. But I think opening as a pandemic much, uh, yeah, I, I, much like Lori, it's the only thing I know. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I feel like I have an advantage, honestly. Yeah, well, it's very, uh, for, for us at BookNet and for a lot of people probably in this meeting, we just find you brave and courageous. <laughs> at the best of times to open a bookstore is brave and courageous. And now during this time and to, and to keep putting the energy into this so awesome. Um, it's, the next question I'm going to go uh, in reverse order, start with you, Carrie, and then uh, Laura, you're going to stay in the middle. <laughs> and then, in the middle. Okay. So what were your expectations about running a bookstore versus what it was really like? I know you've alluded to uh, some of your thoughts uh, pre-bookstore launching, but now you're actually running the bookstore. How's it? How's it matching up? Um, honestly, this is, I'm, keep in mind, I am not two months in. So I, I have um, really rose colored glasses potentially, but it is the best thing I ever did. So it's actually way more awesome than I thought it was going to be. Uh, like, you know, I have had a business before and um, I, and it was fine, but this business is, <laughs> It is just all of the awesome. Um, the people that come in, they're so excited to see me. They're so happy to talk about books. I thought, oh, as a bookseller, I get to talk about books. And I do. Like I thought, oh, and that's probably not going to be true. No, what it is. I get to. I get people ask me, what do you want to read? What do you read? Oh, my gosh. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I guess I didn't know is just how much all I do is think about the bookstore. <laughs> at all times like I, I can't turn it off so I just started closing one day a week on Mondays and I was like I can't do bookstore stuff but actually I have to I like I just there's way too much to do so that that part of it uh, I guess would be more of a surprise the, the other big surprises and that this isn't probably nice to say I don't get the publishers and the distributors and how they do things. And I'm having a hard time understanding it. And I've been in other industries and I'm surprised by that, about how complicated it is. It's just, that part is surprising. Well, that's really interesting. Um, Lori. Okay, you can literally just rewind what was just said. That's exactly. <laughs> Um, it, yeah. the the idea of you know um i get to sit talk about books all day it's going to be so wonderful absolutely i that happens you people come in and you find yourself like with a 20 minute conversation with someone about a book you read 10 years ago that's great um it, it's all the behind the scenes stuff that i had no idea there was so much like just work um it, it's funny i imagined like you know uh, I don't know, like a Disney bookstore, you know, where I just flit around and take books <laughs> off the shelves. And I didn't, I didn't anticipate the, all the work. And we too just started closing Mondays. We were open seven days a week. We just started closing Mondays 
Monday is one of my days off now, but I'm, I find myself doing book work, bookstore work at, at home, you know, searching for books and putting orders in because when you're in the store, you don't want to be doing that. You want to be talking to people. Um, so yeah, exactly the same for me. It, I, I imagined it this kind of, you know, like I said, it, like a Disney bookstore, like Beauty and the Beast when Belle goes in the bookstore where it's just all fun and games and books <laughs> everywhere. And, and you don't, I didn't anticipate the, the work. Well worth it, absolutely worth it. Just totally didn't anticipate that. Stacy, do we just uh, hit the replay button for you? <laughs> a little bit, although I'm feeling rather spoiled because um, because we have I have two additional business partners, one who does the music side of things mm -hmm. and one who um, sort of does everything. But she comes from a retail background. She also worked at a bank. Um, and she actually enjoys like the administrative, the like bookkeeping. She does our cash flow stuff. She does the like I know how to do the ordering, but she is the one who connects with the distributors. Um, so I, I'm very spoiled. I definitely feel like I get to just swoon in and talk about books, um, <laughs> which is absolutely wonderful. You know, it really is so much fun. Um, things that have surprised me that I didn't expect. Um, in a small town is I kind of I mean I knew people were keen on it um, but the amount of support from the locals here and the amount of enthusiasm you know for me um, just my personal interest a big part of it was creating a space with like a real energy you know I spent a lot of time on decor and what it's going to look like and what it's going to feel like and how it's going to flow um, and just having people come in and say, which almost happens every day, someone says, this space is just so amazing. And the books that you guys have picked, like the amount of positive feedback, like I knew people would feel that way, but people go out of their way to express it. Um, and that feels so wonderful. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, the other thing that I find surprising, a uh, couple things is the amount of power that you have to hand sell things as a bookseller. I mean, I, I knew that I would talk to people about books and I wanted to. And so um, I love that part. But, you know, I have, you know, every time I read a book that I really like, um, I look at the sales and it's significant. The number of times people come in and they're like, well, what do you think? And I'll say, oh, I've read this. This is what this is like. And they end up buying them consistently, you know, which I kind of I mean, of course they do. It makes sense. But uh, at the same time, I kind of thought people would say, oh, OK, well, that sounds interesting, but I'm going to buy this, you know. Um, so the power of sort of hand selling really is stronger than I thought it was. Um, the other kind of thing that just sort of randomly I didn't anticipate so much is the amount that TV and movie adaptations mm. Um, the amount of effect that they have on book sales. So Dune, for instance, which, you know, we know is a sci-fi book written in the 1970s. It's already been made into an adaptation. You know, anyhow, um, with the new movie coming out, we ordered a few extra. Um, but I didn't anticipate the amount of demand for that, given that the movie has come out. So it's kind of cool to see how culture kind of vibes between um, sort of popular culture in TV and film and um, books as well. So that's, uh, that's been kind of a fun surprise for me too. Yeah, that is, I mean, those, those are such great uh, stories and alluding to the superpowers of the hand selling bookseller. Uh, it is like a superpower and it's, it's nice to have that maybe like a little bit like mind control or something <laughs> well and I just love I love when I do that and someone buys the book and then they come back in and they say oh that like you recommended that and I love that and you know it's just I guess that that continuous relationship um yeah. is just so wonderful and building up that trust yeah yeah okay I'm I, I should say that I do have a background in book selling as well. I <laughs> worked in almost every bookstore. I live in Guelph and I can just sort of agree with everything you're saying. I've, I've never owned a bookstore, but all, all these things are just ringing so true for me. I guess third question is, would you say there were unique challenges you faced opening your physical and or virtual doors during a pandemic? Now, 
this might be a little tough to answer, um, not knowing what the challenges would have been otherwise, but do you see that there were unique challenges? I'm gonna start with Lori. I know you've alluded to some of the unique challenges. So. We, there were, um, I think it's kind of a double-edged sword. I think at least for us, because um, we had renovated an 135 year old building right in the heart of the downtown of our small town, we had a lot of buzz before we even opened. So we were lucky that way because people had heard about us. We had started our social media well before we had opened. Um, I think we started our social media in March with just kind of, you know, get your bookmarks ready. We're opening summer 2020. So we had a lot of, of um, a lot of word of mouth and, and a lot of buzz about us. But at the same time, when the pandemic started and everything shut down, we missed that. Um, I think we missed that of, of people knowing about us. I, I'm always amazed that we're almost a year and a half, 18, 19 months in, and we still have people that come in that are from Amherstburg that come into the store and say, oh, I didn't know you were here. <laughs> and I'm like, how did how do you not know we're here? Like we're right on the corner of a street in the downtown across from the post office. How do you not know we're here? So that that was a little bit of, of a challenge, kind of getting your name out there with without people being around kind of a thing, if that makes sense, right? People weren't out and about as much. Um, we really relied on, on our social media, our, our newsletter. Um, so that that was a challenge because you're starting from nothing. It's not like you're an established business and you can just get the word out that, oh, hey, we have curbside. We had to not only let them know we had curbside, we had to let them know we were even there. So I think that was the biggest challenge we faced. Um, and the same with virtual, right? It's it's the, the trying to get people to know you're even there when you weren't there before. Um, so that, I think that was our biggest challenge is just letting people know about us when you're, you're starting from scratch. We were lucky that we got a lot of press. It doesn't hurt that Richard's kind of a big deal in you know um, Ontario or Toronto, um, but we got a lot of press for the renovations of the building. We got a lot of press because it was Richard. We got a lot of press because we haven't had a bookstore in town for years, decades. Um, we were lucky that way, but that was still a bit of, of, of a challenge of just getting getting you out there in a closed down world. Stacy, over to you. Yeah, I think for me, um, for us, one of the biggest challenges was just sort of anxiety around what was going to change, you know, in terms of numbers and, you know, how many people are allowed in the store. Are we going to go back to lockdown? Are we going to? So, we, what we did is um, I had seen online this little travel trailer that someone had cut the side open um, to make an awning door. And it was like a little mobile hair salon or something for weddings, something like that. Um, and I saw that and I thought like, oh my gosh, that's fun. Um, you know, why don't we do a bookmobile so that while we're trying to find a space, Revelstoke is a resort town. We have a really popular um ski hill here so what, it, that was the other thing is that uh the amount of tourism that has been happening or had been happening through the summer months for things like mountain biking and stuff it was just not there so you know part of my fear was without that um sort of influx from sort of that resort town from people coming from elsewhere are we going to be is this a viable business you know will we be able to to operate that way um, anyways, backtracking, uh, it was really hard to find a space that we liked, um, and I didn't want to settle on something that didn't feel like it was in the right place. So in the meantime, what we did is we created this bookmobile. Um, we towed it around town to different parks and different areas. Um, it was a lot of fun, and it, it ended up being, even though I came to it mostly because I thought it was just really cool, um, it ended up being a great solution during COVID because there were times we opened the bookmobile the very end of May. Um, and so I can't remember exactly what we've gone through so many iterations of rules. <laughs> um, there was a time when it was like only outdoor gatherings or only, you know, people weren't really in shops, but because we were essentially open air, um, we got around some of that. 
Um, so that was, that was really nice. But then of course, when we did find a space, we were able to work out of the bookmobile while we were renovating. And then the, the anxiety for me was, okay, we've got this grand opening planned and we want to do this. We want to have music there. We want to do this. Are we going to be able to do it, you know, or are our restrictions going to change? And, um, luckily for us, I think we were quite spoiled to, I mean, we have a fairly small space to begin with. So it wasn't like we had, you know, ideas of packing over a hundred people in there. Um, but that said, I think we managed to get away with being able to do our opening as we wanted. So our brick and mortar store opened at the end of September and it happened to be still in a little bit of a lull there before, you know, things hyped up again. So we fortunately were able to do that. Um, we also being music, we offer, we do live music, um, performances every couple of weeks. So, um, that was also, you know, okay are we doing it right? You know, we're, we're technically within the guidelines, but some of the guidelines are vague. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're uh, thought of well in the community. We don't want to think, you know, have people thinking that we're bending the rules to be able to offer these things. So I think just understanding the guidelines and the implications around them was probably the most stressful part of um, sort of the pandemic challenges for me. Is the bookmobile still part of your uh, functioning? Book yeah, farm? so she's overwintering right now. She's hibernating. Um, we get a lot of snow here in Revelstoke, so uh, I can't be, you know, I can park it anywhere without worrying about that. So it's under an enclosed space. Um, but I have big plans. My hope is that with hopefully things opening up further in the summer, I'll be able to take the bookmobile to festivals. We have like the Caslow Jazz Festival in the Kootenai area. Um, Salmon Arm has a Roots and Blues Festival. We've been at the farmer's market before. Um, and I'm crossing my fingers, but I'm not holding my breath that I might get in with, uh, be able to be at some of the BC park sites for camping. So I have this idea that I could go camping with my children um, in areas because around here there's areas with no cell reception so you're off you're off the grid but we could be there and hey look a bookmobile I'm, I need a book I'm camping so um, that's that's my hope is to kind of vacation work but maybe only a few hours a day uh, you know on a real casual basis but uh, bus man's holidays yeah <laughs> <laughs> perfect uh, Carrie your unique uh, challenge I had, yeah I would say not not really. The biggest one was uh, what the pandemic has done to um, renovations in uh, Victoria prim 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 primarily. So I had a hard time finding contractors, honestly, and that I'll blame that on the pandemic. Um, so that was that was very challenging. But uh, and then I also had a problem like I wanted to do a grand opening event. But when I opened in December, we were all locked down and we continue to be quite locked down here. So no grand opening events. So kind of like everyone else, it's been hard to let people know. I'm starting to do some more advertising and that, but at the same time, I was happy to be, go a little bit slow to begin with, because I don't know what I'm doing. Like I am <laughs> brand new to the industry. And uh, frankly, the biggest problem I had was the atmospheric river. Like I opened December 1st, I mm. think the river hit um, British Columbia and knocked out the main road <laughs> here. Um, like, November 27th or something like as you can picture all my books coming to my bookstore for <laughs> not making it so I opened December 1st with a half empty store just with you guys are living it too are your packages here no so anyway there's more to come come back is basically the message I gave so luckily the pandemic wasn't so bad um just the contractor thing and then the no grand opening event but other than that it's fine. I'm happy I'm in retail and not in restaurants right now. <laughs> Good point. And did you, uh, was Harry Potter among the uh, ones that made it in for? <laughs> nope. Nope. No, they weren't uh, here. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> okay. I'm going to move on to the next question. And this one could be risky. What do you think sets you and your store apart from the retailers who establish themselves in the before COVID times, BC. And let's see, where am I gonna go? Uh, Stacy, 
you're gonna <laughs> you know I think probably the biggest thing is uh expectations perhaps you know mm -hmm. like not not I think we've all kind of touched on it not having been established prior uh we didn't have these big expectations of think how things ought to have been so uh in a way I think you know we're lucky because we have come into it with expectations of constantly sanitizing of having masks available of you know really looking at government policy and being aware as a business person. Um, and then actually, I think too, we're so lucky to be in this time when we're offering these services and expecting to, and you know, looking forward to these curbside things or really developing a web store or, you know, hey, we've been all doing Zoom things for the last year, let's do a Zoom book club, no big deal. You know, like I think the advantage is that we have taken it in stride based on when we started. Um, speaking to my, our bookstore, um, I think the bookmobile was probably our biggest advantage that way. That set us apart. But that's, you know, COVID or not, you know, a bookmobile isn't so usual. Although I have been told, and I know they exist, bookmobiles that are run by libraries and places that, you know, don't always get serviced. So um, I did have to make that clear for people when we were out in the open that we are a little bookstore and not associated with the library, especially because people know my face from the library in Revelstoke as well. So. <laughs> that, that, I was wondering if the bookmobile came from your library background or not. But. Well, yeah, I, I knew the word bookmobile for sure and had heard, you know, of that. It's neat to see people and I, I don't know if I never did look up to see if there are any operational ones currently in Canada. Do you guys know? Of uh, retail bookmobiles? No, like a, a library one still. Uh, I believe so. There I must think, be. Yeah, yeah I we, guess, hey? We, we have some here in Guelph. So. Do you? Okay. I mean, yeah. Always my favorite part. I worked at a library too, at the library yeah. as well. So. <laughs> Common ground. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, we're all in the same ground. <laughs> Except for Carrie, who's going to answer them. No. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, well, good question, Tom. Or Tom, yeah, Tim. Tim, Tim same. Call me Tom. Same. Okay, sure. Um, good question because it it's still something I'm trying to figure out here in Victoria because really I'm not. I'm blocks away from Monroe's and I'm blocks away from Russell. So um, and I'm at a bit of a drive from Bolins, but um, ultimately what I am is a community bookstore. So that's it. Like I'm here in the neighborhood of Fairfield and. Uh, that is the message that I deliver. So, uh, and it absolutely makes a difference to the people of Fairfield. They love it. They walk here, they love it. They wanna build community again. As I thought might be the case is turning out to be true. People are coming back because they want to build the community. They had a bookstore here for 20 years on this street. It went away five or six years ago. They don't want it to go away again. And they're saying that, so. Um, I, I can't, I cannot compete with Russell's and Monroe's, not even close. Are you kidding me? Those are gorgeous, big, huge, been around forever places. So I have to be different. So I'm a lot smaller. I can't carry as much. Um, you're here for the conversation with me, <laughs> ultimately, I guess. Great. That's my differentiator. <laughs> that's, that is, that's clear. That's a good one. <laughs> Laurie? Over to you. I think I think the difference between um, us and other retailers, I'm, I'm not going to say bookstores, but other retailers, we're a little more flexible, if that's the right word. Um, I think that established retailers sometimes do things just because that's the way it's always been done. And with us opening in COVID, like Stacy said, you know, one day you can do this, but the next day you can't do that. You have to do this. And we've just um, learned to be way more flexible. Okay, we can't do that. Well, how will we do this? We couldn't have, you know, in-person book clubs. So, okay, we'll do virtual. We were, you know, then we can open up, but we can only have a few people in, in the, the store. We have an event space upstairs. So, and I don't know who, what, angel we had on our shoulder but our event space is set up so that we can do virtual we can zoom out to people but we can also zoom people in 
at the same time. So you can, we zoomed in Brian Burke for an event. He was at home on a big screen in our event space. We had people in the room and people at home all watching. So we can do our book club now with people in the room and people at home at the same time. So I think it's, I think what, what we do differently is we're more, we can pivot and adapt more easily than, than other retailers. I see a lot of retailers all over the place, not just in Amherstburg, who get stuck in that, oh, well, this is how we do it. And we can't do it now because, you know, COVID. But you can, you can almost do anything if you just adapt it a little bit. And I think that, I think that's one of the things that, that sets us apart is we're willing to, okay, we can't do it that way. Let's figure out a way we can do it then. Yeah, that is, that's an awesome uh, perspective. And I, I think you nailed it on the head for sure. Just that uh, you, you came in at what everyone is saying, you know, leapt retail ahead 10, 15 years, but you didn't know that. <laughs> you were just there at the beginning. <laughs> and uh, that flexibility is awesome. Question number five, has it been difficult to forge an identity within your customer base or get to know your customers and how to serve them in a unique fashion? What I'm hearing is you're really connected with your communities and your customers, but, and I know that you've talked about the social media part, but maybe you can just develop that idea a little bit further about how how you are connecting with your customer base and how you're getting to know them. And I think I'm gonna start with Carrie this time. <laughs> well, sure. probably, you know, we can take this back to the pandemic question. Um, one of the hardest things has been recognizing my customers. Ah. Um, you know, they're wearing a mask mm. and a hat and um, a part of creating a community bookstore <laughs> is getting to know people's names. And they recognize me because I'm the same person there at all times. And uh, I don't recognize them. Like you wear one thing differently and I'm not going to recognize you. Even if you're exactly the same way, I probably aren't going to recognize you, which isn't my favorite. Um, so that so that part is challenging. I did just start a point system, though, at my store, which is making a difference. So I can ask people their name comfortably because they need to, I need to know their name to go into the system. And then I get to practice saying it a couple of times. So I'm hoping that that help, helps to bring some of that awareness and bring some of that knowledge of the customer. Also, because it is just me, I get to say, what do you want to see in the store? Do, do you like what you saw? Um, talk to me about, I'm an open book. Like what, what kind of books do you want to see? Mm -hmm what well, kind of um, kid stuff or whatever. Like I'm, I'm kind of, there isn't toy stores here either. So I have a fair amount of those things. So I'm very open to it. It's really just asking and they love it. They love having a say and they like when they come in next time, there's what I, I brought in what they, what they requested. So they have a say, it feels like their community bookstore. Lori. Uh, this is a tricky one because like I said before, that the background stuff in the store that you that you have to do is so not what I expected. So the learning curve there has been like straight up, no curve at all, just straight up line. Um, <laughs> but the curve, the learning curve for learning about your community is such a longer one, especially if you've been, you know, you have to close down, you can only do curbside, you can only have so many people in the store. It's a longer curve. Um, I had anticipated that by the time we were in business for a year, I would pretty no, much know what the community likes to read. I'd be ordering all the exactly right books and I'm still not there. Um, it's, it's just a longer, a longer curve. And uh, I'm finding too that we have a core group of, of like local people that come in all the time. But then we also have people that are coming from like what I consider to be quite a distance. You know, it's not hundreds of miles away or anything, but I, I think, wow, they hear about us, you know, in the in two municipalities over and they'll travel out in the middle of the week to, you know, well, we just wanted to come to the bookstore. So it, it's that makes it a, even a little harder 
because you're trying to not just only match your own community, but to serve the greater community as well. Um, so I'm getting there, but it's that one's more of a flat learning curve as opposed to the, you know, learning how to order books and and do all the other administration stuff, which is literally straight up. And, and do you have a loyalty program there as well? Or? We don't, but a lot of people have been asking about it. So I'm wondering if maybe we might have to get one. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, um, I don't, it's interesting. I think being in a small town and having been here for a while um, in different roles in the community and having done quite a bit of volunteer work, um, it's, I feel that I kind of already had a basis for that um, relationship with my customers. And then also because we're three different owners, um, each of us with quite different personalities and backgrounds, um, we each kind of have that connection in a town that is, you know, Revelstoke is, I think, about 10,000 people. Um, I mean, our population skyrockets this time of the year often. This year's been a bit different, but generally speaking, tourist season is a big thing for us. Um, but realistically, I think we had quite a basis moving into the business. Um, so that piece, I didn't find too difficult forging that unique identity. Also because we are servicing this music side of things, which has been quite neglected in our community for some time. You know, we, we have the bar that you could go and do an open mic at, and then we have a beautiful performing arts center, um, which pre-pandemic brings in performers from all over the country who are spectacular. Um, but it's not, there was sort of a gap for, you know, um, performers, whether it's spoken word or music or what have you, that aren't going to play to the huge performing arts center, but don't want to just be background music at the bar. Um, so I think this kind of niche for us with the music piece also kind of helped us establish our identity um, as sort of a cultural hub in our town. Um, which kind of plays into the next question, which yes, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I'm just going to do it. <laughs> Go ahead. Why don't I put that one on the table? Yeah. How are, how are you thinking about leadership and your role in the community? So, yeah. Yes, so take it I away. think also we're really spoiled, or I feel very spoiled to be in a community of amazing creative minds. And, um, you know, we've, we've done, I do a, a segment every Monday on our local radio station, or not every Monday, pardon me, the first Monday of the month. Um, where I talk about things that are upcoming in either music for us, or, you know, I talked about Canada Reads and the Harry Potter event. Um, we've had lots of artists and other people displaying their artwork or wanting to do kind of some collaborations. Um, so it's been, it's been really fun. And I think we've been able to, by virtue of the things I've just said, kind of put ourselves out there as this cultural hub that just feels great to kind of be showcasing that and be available for people to come with their ideas and know that we can collaborate um, around making okay. things happen. Good. Carrie just demonstrated the versatility of a bookseller in Zoom meetings, selling <laughs> books, it's all happening. I forgot I was on, I was on, not on mute. <laughs> Sorry, Stacy. I, I think Stacy, you are done. I am done. You're right. <laughs> and so, Carrie, I was going yeah. to you next, anyway. So, how are you thinking about leadership and your role in the community? Yeah, exactly. So, the my whole tagline would be a community bookstore. So, it is talking to the community and being a part of the community to do book clubs, readings story times. I sell kites here. We're two blocks from the beach. Nobody in the area sells kites. We're doing, I had a kite guy come and say, I will come and do a kite building workshop here. I'm so excited for it, for the kids. So oh, wow. I just need COVID to go away a little bit so I can really open up this stuff. But um, I sent it a message. I think they got the message. So it's going to go now. And uh, that's how I'm going to do it. That's just through events, very small. Like we're a small community bookshop. I don't have big dreams of taking over Victoria, but Fairfield <laughs> only. <laughs> and over to you, Lori. Um, I love this question because this has been like a, one of our core values at, at the shop is that we want to be a third place. 
your, your first place is your home, your second place is work. We wanna be a third place in the community, some place that you go to, to chat, to hang out, to talk about you know the day's events. So we've always operated um, to fulfill that, that value that we have. So we do a lot of events with um, uh, what the community likes to hear about. We do a lot of events that kind of push the envelope a little bit. We've had a number of um, social justice events. We had the Ottawa police chief um, speak via Zoom about uh, systemic racism in policing. We've had a, a local um, one of, our, he was the director of our, rec, our parks and rec department here in the town. Um, he's a huge birder. So he's been in three times to do presentations on owls. He once called one day in the middle of the day and said, Lori, is there anybody in the store? And I'm like, yeah. He says, I got a red tailed hawk. I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> and he showed up in the store with this hawk and did a whole 20 minute presentation uh, about birds. And every time we have an event with him, it's, it's always a free event, but I always say it's sold out within hours. So if we announce Phil's coming in to talk about birds, you better get to us quick and reserve your spot or you're going to miss it. So we, we're always trying to do that. We're trying to include um, different community groups. We have a, a vegetarian restaurant in town, just a small little restaurant, and we're having an event in March, hopefully, if we can, um, where she'll come in and talk with one of our owners about you know, vegetarian food and, and vegetarian lifestyle. Um, we're partnering a lot with different um, businesses and organizations. Uh, you know, we've, we've got our local authors. So we're, we're always trying to be that third place, that place that you don't just go to buy a book, but you might go to sit, you know, we've got a fireplace, we've got cozy chairs around the fireplace. You'll go and sit down and talk and, you know, read your book for a little while. It's, it's, that's our goal to be that third place. Thanks. Is there alcohol involved? No. Um, Never in our upstairs, we're hoping to one day get, we might have a little liquor license up there. So you never know. You never know. Well, uh, this has been an incredible conversation. That That's the end of my uh, uh, questions that I have for you. But um, thank you so much for this. And I think we're going to open it up. We've had a lot of questions come in. Just gonna pull over some of those and let's see what I think we have about 12 minutes to go through some of these. So let's see. From the chat, Cole Davidson, we are opening this summer and of course the most challenging part about planning has been trying to project sales and expenses. What have been the biggest differences between your plan and reality since you've opened? Have you found your sales to be similar to what you projected? Have your working hours been similar to what you projected? Have you the types of books that you stock, have the types of books that you stock changed since you started? Have there been any disappointments? It's a bunch of questions. Um, Whoever wants to start, feel free. I, I can, I'll say this for, and this might not be the case for other people. My husband gave me a, a term called, um, if it took you twice as long and cost you twice as much and you made half as much, would you still do it? Hmm. And he was saying that to me at the beginning because he was trying to prepare me that this was <laughs> going to take me twice as long, cost me twice as much. I opened, I got the lease on November, I opened December 1st and under budget and my sales are more than I thought they'd be. And I work way more than I thought I would. So <laughs> um, it's actually, it's all like negative, like way, like my expenses were way less than I thought they'd be, which is surprising. And then my um, income is more than I thought it would be or the oh. revenue. Yeah, so it's awesome. good. It's a good news story. Yeah. Anybody else want to jump on that one? I, I don't. <laughs> I don't think anything is what I expected it to be. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, our, I didn't really think about projecting what our sales would be. Um, I'm, I'm lucky in that Richard and his wife Colleen kind of deal with that part of it. They worry about that. I just have to sell books. Um, I, 
but at the same time, I've, it's, we've been busier. So I know, I know what the sales are. So that's, yes, the sales have been higher what, than what I thought they would be. Um, but I, it, like books, books, of course, like what the community wants, what I would stock is definitely changing all the time. I, I, you know, you have your base of what you know, what your computer, your community will read, but then there, there's always, I'm always surprised by, by things that all of a sudden start to sell. And then I'm like, well, I never thought anybody around here would want to read about that. So mm -hmm. I guess we're going to get those kind of things. Um, none, no real disappointments. I, I think that's a, a result of COVID. I don't get disappointed about things because I just, you just assume, <laughs> that, you know, the next, I don't know, I don't want to call it a punch, but you just assume the next punch is coming. So no big deal. We'll just work it, work around it. Um, Resilient. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't think we've ever been in like just a steady area where I can say, okay, is this what we thought? It's always, it's always different than what I thought. Even, you know, while I'm thinking it, it's different than what I thought. Yeah, I remember very much, Cole, uh, that feeling that you're feeling now of um, wanting to project and, and trying, you know, because you want to make sure that your business is going to be viable. It's, it's a big risk. And um, though I can hear it in all of us, we, we want it to be a community thing, but at the bottom line, it, you have to make a go of it. It has to be a sustainable business. Um, so we spent quite a lot of time working on a cash flow projection spreadsheet with, you know, costs and um, estimates when it comes to what we were going to sell. And overall, it's been interesting. We've, we've, we've pretty much consistently underestimated, which I think is the better way to be. <laughs> Certainly leading into Christmas, we vast, I think we doubled our projections for that month. Um, but then for instance, for this month, we're coming in kind of pretty much as targeted. Um, so it's interesting to see the ebb and the flow of that piece. And we did talk to several other retailers in town here to get kind of projections on sales. And then I also talked to a few other independent bookstore owners in similar sized towns to, and they were very generous to share their knowledge with me about sales, um, to kind of get ideas on again, like, yeah, is this going to be worth it to do? Um, can I make a go of it in a, in a community this size? And disappointments, mm, not too many actually. I think one of the, the hardest things in regards to your question about stock change is initially we thought, okay, we're gonna have mostly just um, one copy of each book that we're interested in having um, because we don't, we don't have a huge space. Um, it's about 700 square feet or something, 800 maybe. Um, but then the popularity of books, you know, and you know, you sell it and then, oh, I don't have it. And yeah, you got to get it in and you can, and it's not that long, generally speaking. Um, so it, there's been some learning curves there with, in regards to stock. And that's one of the bigger ones is knowing which titles to have a couple of on hand at all times and which ones you can get away with having just one. So food for thought. And let's hope for no more atmospheric rivers. Yes, no more <laughs> washed away roads. No please. more. <laughs> we need that replenishment piece. Um, this should be a quick one, actually. It's also from Cole. And he's just wondering about your online sales versus your uh, in person sales as various restrictions change. Did you, do you see a real correlation? I mean, um, go ahead. Lori, I feel like you might have a bit more to say on that piece. We've always been open when you could have people in the store. So mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't experienced opening the business with a full lockdown at this point. Um, I can say for myself, I'm consistently surprised by the number of special orders that come through online. Um, that is a piece that we underestimated, you know, it's probably, mm -hmm. and I mean, it's, we worked really hard on creating a website that felt user-friendly and we've done a lot to promote it, but you know, we probably get five special orders a day from our online website which you know in a town our size it, it still shocks me um yeah. so anyhow wow that's that's good we yeah that is. we do notice a bump in online sales when restriction come into play like when we were were only curbside we did get a bump in online sales um but we're 
uh, we would, I'd be, I'd be like so happy if we got five in a day. Um, you know, as I said that, that though, too, I think Revelstoke is a bit of a unique community in that even the basis of people here, it's a quite a young community. There's a lot of young families. And I think um, if you looked at the demographic statistics here, uh, there's a lot of people who just by virtue, you know, default is, hey, I'm just going to check it online, see if they've got yeah. it. Or, hey, I saw this on your Instagram. Um, yeah, we've our, got a lot of engagement that way digitally, I think. Our community is um, skewing older right now. So we get a lot of people who will call or they'll come in and, and order it. Um, but not not it, that doesn't translate into online sales. I, I don't know if that's just because our community skews older or if it's a, a bit that, again, like people don't think to do that. They don't think of, you know, that they can do that. Um, but yeah, I do notice that when when we go into restrictions, we do get an increase in online orders. Definitely. Carrie, I'm going to give you a pass on this one, <laughs> and um, but I am going to start you off with this next one, which may take us to the end. I'm not sure. Uh, we have about four minutes left to go. This is from Sandor Vezer, and Sandor says, I heard that working with distributors and publishing houses has been difficult. <laughs> what are some things you would like to change about your experiences with them? Honestly, tear it all down, tear it all down, build it back up. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like they, um, it, as somebody that's coming a complete new outsider to the industry, I cannot believe how it works. Like I have to match up these invoices and the random things ship and don't ship and what I put in one order, just send me one bill, please. Thank you. I, we will match those two things. <laughs> so, uh, so there's mostly that. And then as I'm just, I started off only with two, um, two accounts and now I'm adding a whole bunch more now that I have some breathing time this month to add the rest of them in and they all got different rules I've noticing. And uh, these guys pay for shipping, but these ones you don't. And uh, anyway, it, honestly, they could start over. I, I don't even have something awesome to say because it, it <laughs> seems like such a mess. <laughs> um, sorry, I hope there's no publishers on here. Oh, I'm sure there are. <laughs> and I'm oh, sure sorry. they've never heard this before. But, no. um, I would say for me, it's finding the ones that you like to work with and sticking with them. I, I do have a few that the reps are excellent. If I ever get a damaged book, it's dealt with quickly. Um, the big challenge, of course, is that each one invoices and ships and does all those things in different ways. Um, some of the frustrations I've had is, you know, there's some great reps or great uh, distributors that are based out east. And if I don't phone at exactly the right time here being in the west, like getting them on the phone, if I ever need to talk can be a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think, I mean, in an ideal world, it would be great if the system was consistent and simplified so it was the same, but um, I have a book that has, you know, the, the <laughs> distributor name and those details in it. And I have my few that I, they, they operate the way that works best for me. And so I mostly rely on them. Yeah, I'm, I'm a year and a half in and I'm still, like shake my head up. Why are we doing it like this? Like this, this is so complicated when it can be so easy. Um, and it's, uh, I, I need to get a book. I have a folder, but it's all just a mismatch. So I need to get a book and have it be like that so that I can look at, and then, and then they'll go and change. Like a, a one, how one publisher will change to a different distributor. Have they done that to you yet? <laughs> yeah, I just got used to this one. Okay, I know that book. I know I have to order it from here. And now they've changed it. Oh, I can't. I just can't. out of curiosity, Lori, how many different distributors do you typically like? How many do you have accounts with? I, I'm gonna say at least fifteen. Okay, because we've got a bunch of like little ones where people have ordered a book. So then I got to start an account with this person or this mm -hmm. company. Um, 
there and I have my favorites. I have like three favorites and I wish I could get every book from them because totally. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> but I can't. So uh, yes, a perennial problem. I could tell you stories, but <laughs> I don't have time because we are at 3 p.m. And that is the end of our webinar. I want to thank everybody very much for listening in. And thank you, Stacy, Lori, and Carrie for your awesome stories. And there's Hannah to say hi. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody. I can uh, talk us out. So uh, before we go, I'd just love to ask you to provide feedback on the panel and the registration process. Uh, we'll drop the link to the survey in the chat. So please take a couple minutes to fill it out if you have time. And we'll also be emailing you a link to a recording of this session as soon as it's available. Uh, lastly, I'd also like to thank the Department of Canadian Heritage for their support through the Canada Book Fund. And thanks again to our panelists and Tim and to all of you for attending. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Bye.